Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's presentation. My name is Alden, and I am a lecture coordinator for IYNA's Introduction to Neuroscience course. In this lecture, you will hear about the action potential by Dr. Jennifer Carbery, an assistant professor of cell biology at Duke. I will now pass on the presentation to her. Dr. Carby, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Alden. I'm really excited to speak to you guys today. This is a really wonderful topic. It can be a difficult topic, but once you understand it, it's really, really important for understanding neuroscience. So I'm a faculty member of the cell biology department at Duke, and I um, used, when I did do research, I did research in aquaporin water channels that are really important in movement of water in places in the body like the kidney. Um, currently, I teach full-time. I teach Duke medical students. So getting a PhD, that's also a um, really rewarding track or opportunity um, for people with PhDs. And just to um, let you know, I encourage you to ask questions. I have several sets of problems for us to work on throughout the lecture, but this is going to be really informal, in part because I'm in my living room. I've got lots of dogs and things happening, so it's going to have to be informal. So feel free to um, ask questions, and we'll get to them um, when we have the different breaks. Okay? Okay, so when we're talking about action potentials, we're going to have to first talk about a few other concepts first before we get to action potentials. And one is the electrical gradient and the importance of that in allowing us to do signaling. Um, and then after we talk about that, we'll be talking about a concept called the equilibrium potential. So each ion that we're going to be talking about will have an equilibrium potential, and we'll talk about how that is determined by the conditions in the cell. And then we're going to talk about types of changes in membrane potential. So one type are going to be graded potentials, and then another type will be action potentials. But it's important to understand both types and so um, we will be talking about both types and kind of comparing and contrasting them. And then we'll get into the nuts and bolts of the action potential. Its shape is going to be dependent upon the characteristics of the channels. And so we'll talk about that. And then I'm going to try to pull it all together for you. Why do we even care about these changes in these signals. What are they doing in the nervous system? And so that's how we will um, finish up, okay? So I just saw in the chat, people were asking about how this relates to yesterday's talk or the previous talk and when you learned about cell types. So that's exactly what I'm gonna tell you about in this slide. So. Neurons are one of the major cell types in the nervous system, which I'm sure you're aware of, and they're going to be important for processing information, sending signals throughout the body and throughout the nervous system. And action potentials are going to be signals that travel along the length of axons and, and uh, neurons. This can be quite challenging because some of our neurons are very long. For instance, we have neurons sitting in our spinal cord, at the base of our spinal cord, that send an axon all the way down to the muscles in our feet. And so these are very long cells. And in order for the, act for the nervous system to function the way we need it to function, signals need to travel along those neurons and axons very quickly. And so, a lot of that signaling along the length of a neuron is going to be via action potentials. Then the other type of signaling, which you're gonna hear more about in the next lecture, is going to be synaptic transmission. So that's going to be signaling between neurons. I'm going to talk about it just a little bit today, 
but that's what is going to be the signaling between two neurons. Okay. Okay, so the first major concept that we need to talk about is the electrochemical gradient. And that is going to be a difference in concentration across the cell membrane in certain ions. The two we are going to care most about today and just often when we're talking about neuroscience are sodium ions and potassium ions. You, I have the concentration differences. They, they can vary from cell to cell, but in general, the sodium um, is going to be really high on the outside of the cell and lower on the inside of the cell. And the opposite will be true for potassium, where it will be higher on the inside of the cell and lower on the really important for the function of the cell. And um, this is established, this gradient is produced or made by a pump called the sodium potassium ATPase. So this is a protein in the membrane of the cell that is pumping sodium out and letting potassium in. And when it's doing that, it's using the energy of ATP. So our bodies spend a significant amount of our energy, our calories, setting up this gradient, pumping these ions. Now, why would you do that? Why would you spend all this energy doing that? You do that so that then you can use this gradient to do work. So you can kind of think of the membrane of the cell like a dam that's keeping all the water to one side of the, of the um, cell, one side of the dam. And then if you put a little hole in the dam, water is going to just come rushing out and you could harness that energy. That's what we do for hydroelectric power. And so that is kind of like what the cell is doing. It, puts the sodium and potassium on opposite sides of the membrane with this big wall, the membrane in between them, and the ions can't cross the membrane by themselves. Instead, they can cross through ion channels and that's like the little hole in the dam and they'll come rushing down their gradient and um, we can use that as um, energy to get things done in the cell. In the case of action potentials, that work that that gradient is doing by having the ions flow down their gradients is the action potential or it's signaling, okay? So that's what the electrical gradient is. You really, when you're doing neuroscience, you have to really kind of memorize, not these specific concentrations, but that sodium is higher on the outside of the cell and potassium is higher on the inside of the cell because it's just critical for so many processes. I see a couple of things about the chloride ions in the chat. We're not gonna worry so much about those, but there can be gradients for other ions as well. Okay, so that's what the electrical chemical gradient is. The cell spends a lot of energy producing it. It uses that energy in a lot of different ways to move a lot of different substances in the body. Today, we're gonna to talk about how it does the work of signaling. Okay, so we've said we have our gradient, right? And that's what's shown right here. Um, in step one. So this is similar to the situation we have in real life where we have a cell, it's got a lot of potassium inside and then a lot of sodium on the outside. We've got a membrane that won't let these two cross unless there's some sort of specific channel like an ion channel. And it's very important to understand the characteristics of ion channels. One is that they're going to be specific. So that means that um, an ion channel that moves potassium, for instance, is going to um, 
move only potassium and not sodium. Whereas um, a channel that moves sodium is only going to be moving sodium. So ion channels are specific for the ion that they move and they're gated. So if we talk about how we're using all this ATP to separate the ions so we can do work with them, we don't want to put holes in our dam just willy nilly all the time because that's going to waste the, the energy that we put into separating the ions. So we want to highly regulate when we open up holes in the dam, when we open the channels. And so the channels will be gated um, by different mechanisms. And we'll talk about a couple today. And then the other thing to remember about the ion channels is that they are going to be um, bi-directional. channel, it just depends on the forces that are acting on it. So um, whether it's a chemical force or an electrical force, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So those, just keep that in mind. Those details are important for understanding this. So when we're in this stage one, then um, we're saying that the membrane potential of this cell is zero. We don't have a charge difference. We have a difference in the concentration of potassium versus sodium, but those are, um, all those positive ions are balanced by negative ions. And so, and we don't have any ions flowing. So we really don't have a, a charge difference across the membrane. In this diagram, we have these blue rectangles in the membrane. Those are potassium channels. So we're, they're going to be specific for potassium. And when we open them, potassium is going to want to leave the cell because of um, the chemical gradient. So um, there's a lot of potassium inside the cell, not much outside the cell. So potassium is going to want to leave the cell. And each time a potassium ion leaves the cell, the um, charge in the cell right next to the membrane will become more negative. And the charge on the outside will become more positive. So that's what you're showing here. I'm showing here in step two. We have this huge chemical gradient for potassium, so potassium starts to leave. It gets more positive on the outside of the cell, more negative on the inside of the cell. Nothing's happening with sodium because it can't move. Then um, when we keep having the potassium leave here in step three, more and more, and um, then eventually it will get so negative here inside the cell that some potassium will come back in uh, because of the charge difference. So we still have this big chemical gradient of potassium wanting to leave because of the chemical gradient. But now it's so negative here in step three that now some potassium is coming back in because it's a positive ion. So at this point in stage three, where we've got a lot of negative charges on the inside of the cell, then we would say the membrane potential of the cell is negative because inside the cell is more negative compared to the outside because we had positive charges leaving, okay? Then in step four, now we've had potassium still leaving because of the chemical gradient, but now it is so negative in here, inside the cell, that an equal amount number of potassium ions are coming into the cell because it's so negative. And so this, whatever the membrane potential is at this point, is what we call the equilibrium potential for potassium, okay? So this is a really important um, concept. 
and it's really can be tough to get. And I would encourage you, we're going to have a question about it in a minute. I would encourage you to write it out on a piece of paper. I'll show you how to do that in a minute to think about this. So I'm going to say it several more times, okay? Because I know this is difficult. So when you open an ion channel for a specific ion, what's going to happen is the ions are going to go down their chemical gradient until the um, electrical gradient is equal and opposing. So what that means is in this case for the potassium, we're opening the channel and it, the potassium is going down its chemical gradient out of the cell, making it really negative in the cell. That's going to continue until it's so negative that then as many potassium ions are coming in because it's so negative. And so you have still potassium flowing out and you have potassium flowing in the same numbers. And so that means the membrane potential is staying the same. Let's say it's at minus 70 millivolts because now we have equal and opposing forces that are acting on the potassium ions, okay? So does everyone understand that? We can, uh, I think I have a question about it coming up soon and we can hopefully get some more um, clarity on that. And I've got some more examples too. So if you still don't quite get it, uh, we have some more talking to do about it, okay? So this is just showing you a little bit of a different view of this. So remember, we said that um, if there wasn't a, um, let me back up a little bit. So we're going to, um, in this slide, we're talking about sodium specifically, where we said that um, sodium is high on the outside of the cell and lower on the inside of the cell. So if we look at it the same way we look, just looked at potassium, then if we add open sodium channels, then sodium is going to want to come into the cell because there's so much on the outside and it's going to keep coming into the cell until the cell is so positive that then sodium starts to eventually leave and then the chemical gradient and electrical gradients are equal and opposing. So that means that whenever we have more sodium on the outside of the cell than we do on the inside, then that means our equilibrium potential for sodium will be positive. So in a typical cell, the sodium equilibrium potential is going to be 60 millivolts. It's going to be positive because the equilibrium potential is going to be the membrane potential that occurs whenever you open channels for that ion. And so we said, because of our gradient for sodium, if we open sodium channels, it's going to rush in until there's so many positives in here that it is much is rushing in because the chemical gradient, that same number will be leaving because of the electrical gradient. And so then if we see what the membrane potential is at that point in time, it will be positive. Okay, and so that's, um, that's why the equilibrium potential for sodium will be positive. Okay. Excuse me, Professor. Yes. Can you explain what E N A means over there? Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Um, so that just means what is the equilibrium potential for sodium? So the E is really standing for equilibrium potential for sodium. And that in, a, in many cells, it's going to be positive, something like 60 millivolts. Okay. Any other burning questions? I'm still going to keep talking about this concept for a little while longer. Okay, so then let's kind of look at the same situation um, for potassium. So for potassium, 
it's very similar to that first example where it's really high inside of the cell and it's low outside. If we open up potassium channels, they're going to go down their chemical gradient and potassium is going to just keep leaving the cell. And if you've got positive ions leaving the cell, then the inside of the cell is going to become more negative. Enough potassiums are going to leave it. It's so negative inside the cell, it's actually going to be drawing some potassium ions into the cell. And, um, but yet it'll still be negative. And when it rests at that spot, because we've got the same number leaving as the same number coming in, at that point, the membrane potential will be negative. And so that's why here on this little graph, it's showing that the um, equilibrium potential for potassium is usually going to be negative in the cell because the potassium is so high in the cell, open channels for it, it's going to rush out and that's going to make negative charge inside of the cell. Eventually they'll stop rushing out so much because there'll be more coming in to balance the um, electrical and chemical gradients, but it will still be negative inside the cell. And so that's why the equilibrium potential for potassium is negative. So it's really a brilliant system because what nature has done is it's taken two different positive ions and put them on the opposite sides of the membrane. And because it's done that, then that means one of them has a positive equilibrium potential and the other one has a negative equilibrium potential. And you'll see how we're gonna use that for signaling, okay? So just keep in mind just the general definition of an equilibrium potential for a certain ion is that's what the membrane potential is going to become if you open ion channels for that ion. And what it will be, the, the number that it will be, this positive 60 or the minus 90 is determined only by what is the concentration of the ion on one side of the membrane versus the other side of the membrane. Okay, so I'd encourage you if, to really um, take time with a piece of paper and a pencil and you can draw a circle for a cell and draw some little ions and open up the channel and say, okay, they're going to move in this direction because of the chemical gradient. They're gonna keep doing that until it's so negative or positive inside the cell that then that flow eventually stops, uh, net flow. And then where, what will the um, membrane potential be at that point? And that will be the equilibrium potential. Okay. So right now we're only talking about one ion channel opening at a time. We're not talking about more than one. We'll do that in just a minute. But when you're talking about the equilibrium potential, you're talking about only one type of ion channel being open for the cell to get to that potential, okay? So here's a question, let's go over that and then maybe we can take a break for um, the TAs to let me know about questions that keep popping up. So if we have a negatively charged ion that's more concentrated on the inside of the cell than the outside, what will the equilibrium potential be? Okay, so will it be positive or will it be negative? So think about that and you might wanna write, do a drawing if that'll help you draw a cell and you could draw like some chloride ions that are more concentrated inside that cell than they are on the outside. And then if you open chloride channel, which way is the chloride going to flow? because of the chemical gradient, and then what will the charge be inside the cell because of that flow? And I'm going to stop sharing for just a second so that I can pull up the, um, so I can draw.
So do you get, do a few of you want to put your guess for this answer? If we've got, let's say chloride ions. I'm having, okay. Sorry, my drawing is not going to be very good here, guys. But here's a really shriveled cell. And this is how I just suggest you draw it out. So let's say we've got lots of negative ions in here. So the concentration of the ions inside the cell is high, outside it's low, right? And so then if we open a channel for these ions, let's call them chloride ions, then they're going to leave the cell and become positive. Okay. And then eventually at the end, we'll still have our gradient for chloride. It will still, not many ions have moved. So we still have more chloride inside the cell than we have on the outside. But now it's so positive in here that just as many chlorides are coming in because it's positive, then are leaving because of the chemical gradient. So that means that we have a balance in the chemical and electrical gradients. They're equal and opposing. So the membrane potential will stay where it is because just as many chlorides are leaving as are coming in because of the chemical gradient wanting to come out and the electrical gradient coming in. And so that means the equilibrium potential for this chloride in this situation is going to be positive, okay? That's going to be the answer. When you have more chloride inside the cell versus outside and you open the, up the ion channels, chloride's gonna rush out until it becomes, the two grains become equal. And so then the membrane potential will be positive And that means the equilibrium potential for chloride in that situation is going to be positive, okay? Sorry if I have some background noise I'm seeing in the chat. My daughter's taking a dance class, and so <laughs> she'll be done in a half an hour. I hope it's not too loud. Is it okay for you guys? Okay. Um, so I'm going to go back. Any burning questions, TAs, I can answer while I'm going back to my slides? Um, if anyone wants to raise their hand and ask a question or two, I can I can call on some people. Okay, if there aren't any burning, um, there's I think there's one question. Um, Liliana, if you want to unmute, you can ask it. Hi, um, thank you. So mm -hmm. I have two questions. One, um, so our um, chemical gradients are they synonymous to uh, are they synonymous to uh, net forces in a way? And um, my uh, second question is um, just for clarification. I know, sorry for the um, background noise for, with me, but um. Uh, the chemical gradients and the electrical gradients is you're saying that they're working together to kind of push um, ions out of the membrane. I'm, I'm still kind of confused on that. Point. Yeah. So when you're talking about net forces, so the chemical gradient is just one force on the ion and the electrical is the other force. So you can just think about it. The ions each have their two characteristics. They have what are they made of and what is their charge. And so they can have a force on them based on either of those characteristics. So the chloride ions have a force on them because they're um, 
more concentrated on one side versus the other. And then they also have a force applied to them because they're charged. I hope that helps. It does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Sophia, if you want to ask your question. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I don't know if this was already said or not. Maybe I missed it. But what happens like to the cell? What does the cell do once it reaches the equilibrium? Okay, that's a good point. Well, that'll depend on how long those channels stay open and we'll, we're get, going to get into how that's used for a signal. So I think that will be coming up in, uh, I think I'm gonna answer that soon. So hold on to that question. Cause yes, it's not clear why all of this is important but I think you'll see how this comes together. Okay. okay. Yeah, no. Um, and one more question, uh, Begna, mm -hmm. you want to ask it? Um, I'm not sure if this was already addressed in the beginning because I can't seem to hear a lot of things. But like when I was uh, when I had to take a look at some of the action potential graphs, um, when they were doing, whenever they say on whenever it comes to like hyperpolarization. And then it always it like shows like that big um drop in uh, charge. Are they talking about like the outside of the membrane or the inside? Because I know that both. Mm -hmm. happen. Right. Yeah. So it's always referring to the inside. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we're going to go into glorious detail about that in just a minute. So that'll okay. help too. Okay. But yes, it's always referring to the inside. So now, the next question is. Um, we know there's more than one type of ion channel. So what happens when you have more than one type of ion channel open? And so that will um, depend on the number of ion channels that are open and how many ions are moving. So let's um, basically, if we have um, sodium channels open only, then the membrane potential will become the equilibrium potential for sodium because that's the whole definition of an equilibrium potential. If we have only potassium channels open, then the membrane potential will become the equilibrium potential for potassium because that's the definition of equilibrium potential. But if we have both potassium and sodium channels open, then the membrane potential will be somewhere in between the two. It's kind of like you average the two, okay? And so one thing that we need to understand is what is the resting membrane potential? The resting membrane potential is what we say, just a normal cell, what its membrane potential is when it's at rest and when it's not excited and when not a lot of its ion channels are open. And so to determine what the membrane potential is at rest, you have to figure out what are the channels that are open at rest, because that's what's going to determine the membrane potential is really what channels are open. And there's always going to be something open. So that's what this diagram is showing you. So one thing that we have happening that you may be wondering about is, remember we said the sodium potassium ATPase is absolutely essential protein in all our cells. We can't live without it. We're using tons of ATP and it's making that gradient for the sodium and the potassium. And so more specifically, it's pumping three sodiums out of the cell and two potassiums in. So since it's moving ions and it's also moving more sodiums out than potassiums in, it's making a little bit of a charge difference, but it's really not much. It's not moving that many ions per millisecond. So it's a pretty small contribution and it's a pump. It's not an ion channel. So you can really kind of ignore it and say that really, all that we care about are the ion channels. And it, remember I said at rest, we don't have tons of ion channels open, but the ones that we have that are open are some leak channels, meaning they don't move that many ions. And so we have potassium leak channels and we have sodium leak channels. And so um, 
that means that our resting membrane potential is going to be between the sodium equilibrium potential and the potassium equilibrium potential. It ha so happens that we have more potassium leak channels than we have sodium channels. And so that's why our resting membrane potential is a little bit above the potassium equilibrium potential, but closer to that than to the sodium. So let me go back to this one figure to talk about that. So remember, we said if only sodium channels are open, our membrane potential will be, let's say, plus 60. If only potassium channels are open, the membrane potential will become minus 90. When we're at rest, we said we have those leak channels, more potassium leak channels than sodium leak channels. And so that's why the resting membrane potential is going to be negative. It will be above potassium equal. for potassium. So that's why rest is where it is, okay? It's whatever the membrane potential is going to be at any one time is based on which ions are open, which ion channels are open at that point, okay? And usually at rest, it's going to be more potassium um, channels open, so that's why there will be such a negative resting membrane potential, but not all the way down to the equilibrium potential for potassium. So when we, we need to introduce some terms now that we're talking about membrane potential and changes in membrane potentials, and that's what this figure is showing you. So it's got the same axis here where we said resting membrane potential is negative. And when a cell's at rest, we say that the membrane potential is polarized. It's more negative on the inside of the cell than the outside of the cell. So at rest, the membrane potential of a cell is polarized. There's a charge difference. And more specifically, it's more negative. If, we, if the membrane potential heads towards zero or heads towards the positive side, we say it's depolarizing because it's becoming less polarized. And we use these terms all the time. So you really have to just kind of know what they mean really um, without thinking. So then if something's up here and it's positive or it's above rest and it's going back towards rest, we say that it's repolarizing because it's becoming polarized again. So cell starts off polarized. If the membrane potential goes up, let's say because we're opening some sodium channels, then the cell will depolarize. And then if those sodium channels close and we open potassium channels, then it will repolarize, which is become head back towards rest. Okay? Sorry, my dogs are barking. Then if um, we open only potassium channels for some reason, and then the cell will become even more negative than it is at rest. Because remember, resting membrane potential is a little bit above the equilibrium potential for potassium because we do have some sodium channels open. So if we have only potassium channels open, then the cell will get even more negative, its membrane potential, and then it will what we call hyperpolarize because it will become even more polarized, even more negative than it was at rest. Okay, so you'll hear these terms all the time and I'll be using them from here on out. Okay. Okay, so we're going to just for a minute talk about one type of membrane potential change. And we, remember, we said that membrane potential is going to be based on which channels are open. So if we're going to have a change in the membrane potential, that's because we're changing which channels are open. And this we're going to use as a signal. And so you'll see how this is important. First, we're going to start talking about graded potentials, which are a little different from action potentials because they're a different type of ion channel but they're still important for signaling in the neuron. 
So the way I would imagine a graded potential, let's say this white line here is a membrane of a neuron and we have a ion channel here. Let's say it's letting sodium into the cell. And remember I said that ion channels have to be gated. Let's say this one is gated by neurotransmitter. And let's say there's a neuron that's kissing this membrane right here and releasing just a tiny bit of neurotransmitter, which is then opening the sodium channel. And so if we open a sodium channel at the membrane, what is going to happen to the membrane potential there? It's going to head towards the equilibrium potential for sodium, which means it's going to depolarize and the membrane potential is going to increase. And so that's what we see with this green line up here is we added just a tiny bit of neurotransmitter which opened this sodium membrane potential a little bit more positive. And so you see that here, that's called a graded potential. Graded because the amount of response is going to be in proportion to the stimulus. So in our first case, we said, oh, we just added a little bit of neurotransmitter. We just pipetted on. The neurotransmitter is going to diffuse away. It's going to come off of this ion channel. It's, the ion channel is going to close. The sodiums that entered the cell are going to come in, but then they're going to diffuse away. So very quickly, this little depolarization, this little um, increase in positive charge is going to go away. But if we stimulate it again, this time with even more neurotransmitter, then we will activate more of those ligand gated, neurotransmitted gated channels. We'll let in more sodium so that we will have a bigger depolarization, a bigger signal and it will affect a larger portion of the membrane and it will stay around longer because we had a stronger stimulus. So these are really important characteristics of graded potential. If you add more stimulus, they'll be bigger. And then you can also add them. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is, um, Similar to action potentials because they involve um, ion channels, but a lot of these characteristics are very different from action potentials, but that helps graded potentials to have their own role in signaling because of these characteristics. Okay, and we're gonna, I'm gonna give you more examples of how these graded potentials work throughout the rest of the talk. So we come to a little stopping point here. I know we still haven't talked about action potentials yet, that's the next step. But we talked about how the equilibrium potential of an ion, that's going to be when the chemical and electrical gradient are equal but um, opposite. And then we also have that sodium potassium ATPs that's important for the whole basis of this because it makes the gradient, it puts the water on the opposite sides of the dam. Um, and it's going to be very important for allowing to have any of this signaling. And then we've talked about grade potentials. Those are going to be electrical signals, but they're going to be um, very local because it's going to diffuse away both the stimulus and the ions that are coming in. And that they can be additive. We'll talk about how they can be um, stimulatory or inhibitory in a minute. And they, they are very different from action potentials, but they're still very important for signaling. Okay, so I think um, I have another question coming up, maybe sometime soon. Okay, it must be in a little bit. Let's go on um, to talk about action potentials right now, and then we'll be able to have a break and take some more questions soon. Okay. Okay, so for action potentials, we are again going to have um, ion channels that are going to be important. We're going to have two different types. 
but their characteristics are going to be very different from those gated channels that we talked about with the graded potentials. These channels are going to be gated by voltage, meaning we have to have a little depolarization of the membrane. So some positive charge coming in, and that is what opens these channels. And the details of these channels are really important for understanding how the action potential works. So that's why I'm going to talk about these two channels for a little while. So we have two types of channels, one a sodium channel, one a potassium channel. They're both voltage gated. They're both open when we have a depolarization, an influx of positive charges come into the cell. And we'll talk about what would cause that in a little while. But they're different. The sodium channel, it senses that depolarization and it opens very quickly. The potassium channel senses the depolarization. It doesn't do anything at first. It's delayed. So that means that at first, after we've had that depolarization, we have sodium coming into the cell, but the potassium channel is not open yet. And remember, we said the membrane potential will be determined by which channels are open. And at first, during an action potential, it's only sodium channels that are open. After a little bit of time, the sodium channel becomes what we call inactivated. There's a little part of the channel that starts blocking the pore, but it's not closed, it's inactivated. And when the sodium channel is inactivated, it can't be opened. A closed sodium channel can be opened again by the depolarization, it's voltage gated again. An inactivated sodium channel, which is what's shown right here, is not able to be opened. So it's just hanging out. At the same time, now the potassium channels are finally waking up and opening. And so then in this, this stage, really we only have potassium channels open. And so that means the membrane potential is going to head towards the equilibrium potential for potassium. That's going to continue until the cell membrane is again repolarized. So once the cell comes to rest, then the channels will um, go back to their closed state and everything will come back to normal. So I'm gonna show this again on the next slide and go through this again. But this, the, each of these characteristics of these ion channels is critical for forming the shape of the action potential. Another thing I just wanna add is that when the sodium channel is inactivated, which means it can't be opened even with voltage, that is important and we'll see why, but it leads to what we call the refractory period. Refractory means it's non-respondent, it doesn't respond. And so that is important characteristic and I'll show you why in a minute. Okay, so here, this is really just showing you the same figure. I've got it all written out here, the different steps. But with what you're used to seeing for the typical shape of the action potential. So we're starting out at rest. And remember, at rest, we have um, just our leak channels are open. And we have more potassium leak channels than sodium leak channels. So we're sitting here just a little bit above the equilibrium potential for potassium. And then we have a stimulus that depolarizes the membrane. And that stimulus can be um, a graded potential. So remember, we said a graded potential, it can depolarize the membrane. And so that graded potential can depolarize the membrane enough to activate these voltage gated channels and cause an action potential. So that's really the main purpose of graded potentials 
is to initiate an action potential. And we'll see why that's important. So once we've got these ion channels open, then we come to stage two. But remember, the sodium channel is going to open very quickly. And at stage two, the potassium channel, it's, see, it's sensing the change of voltage, but it hasn't done anything about it. It hasn't um, opened yet. And so in stage two, now the only ion channel that's open are the sodium voltage gated channels. And they're moving so much sodium that we're ignoring what's happening with the leak channels now because there's so much sodium moving. And if you can think about it, even if not all of the sodium channels open, even if a few of them open, then that's going to continue to depolarize the membrane, which is going to open even more channels. So this becomes a really kind of um, chain reaction of this huge influx of sodium into the cell. And so the membrane potential is going to become positive and it's going to get very close to the e open the sodium channel and so by definition that means the membrane potential is going to become the equilibrium potential for sodium. Then in stage three we have the sodium channels inactivate and now finally our potassium channels have opened and so now we only have one type of channel open it's the potassium channel and so now our membrane potential is going to move towards the equilibrium potential for potassium. Until finally we get down to rest and we can um, close both of the channels and then our membrane potential will, our leak channels will take over and our membrane potential will come back to rest and will stop being hyperpolarized, it won't be down at the equilibrium potential for potassium anymore. So you can see, again, remember I was talking about the electrical, electrical chemical gradient and it's so brilliant because you've got these two different positive ions on opposite sides of the membrane. And so what that allows you to do is you open one and the membrane potential goes up. You open the other, the membrane potential goes down because they're on opposite sides of the membrane. And this makes a signal. So that's why the cell does all that work to put them on opposite sides of the membrane is so they can use this to signal. Okay, so I think we just, we're almost to a stopping point for a question since we're we've kind of finished talking about action potentials for the moment, this is another way to think about the action potential. So we're going to talk about this more, but you learned about neurons and they have an axon and the axon is going to be where you have the voltage gated channels. So this is where you're going to have action potentials because it all depends on what channels you have which are gonna determine whether you have a graded potential or an action potential. So you're in the axon of the neuron, you're gonna have these voltage gated channels, but um, the action potential is only going to travel one direction down the axon. And that is because of the refractory period of the sodium channel. So let's just take this case right here where we've had an action potential, it's gonna start up here and we'll talk about why in a minute. And it's going to be like dominoes where you have one section of the axon has an action potential that's gonna cause a huge rush of sodium to come in, which will then activate the next part of the axon to have an action potential. And it's just gonna go down and down and down because you've got so much sodium coming in that that's going to reach, cause the neighboring part of the axon to reach threshold when you open those channels, the voltage that opens those channels. And so then you'll have an action potential in that part of the axon and it will just go down very fast down the axon. Um, but it can't travel backwards 
So when you have an action potential happening here in the middle of the axon and you have sodium flowing into the axon, it's not going to start an action potential where you just had one because those sodium channels are still in the inactivated state. The ones in front where you haven't had an action potential are closed and ready to be opened, but the ones behind aren't. And so that's why instead of um, always sending like waves frontwards and backwards of action potentials, they just go down in one direction. Like I said, you can just think about it of falling dominoes from one end of the axon until the next. Okay, another thing I forgot to mention with the action potential is when we compare this to the graded potential where we said, oh, if you have more of a stimulus, it'll be a bigger change. That is not the case with an action potential. If you get to threshold where you open up these channels, you will have an action potential and the shape will be basically identical. Either you have one or you don't. Either you reach threshold or you don't. Potentials are all or none. And as they travel down the axon, they look exactly the same. They don't get smaller. It's all or none. You have one or you don't. And that makes it very different from those graded potentials. And we're going to talk about why um, that's important for neurons um, soon. Okay, so action potentials are very different from grade potentials because either you have one or you don't if you make it to threshold. Okay, so here's a question, then we can take a break for some questions as well. So if we um, modify the voltage-gated sodium channel, so that it inactivates um, more rapidly, then how will the action potential change? So if it, um, do you think it will have the same height um, or do you think it will reach a higher point or do you think it will reach a lower point? So let's go back to that figure. So if it inactivates, uh, more rapidly. That means that it will get to stage three more quickly. And so what do you guys think? Do you think this will, if this, if the sodium channels inactivate, which means they stop letting sodium channels, sodium ions in sooner, do you think this, uh, this red line will change? Yes, it will, right? And which way do you think it'll change? Will it go even higher or will it go lower? So think about that for a minute. So Hi, Dr. Andrew, Dr. Yeah. Carvey, just when mm -hmm. they're thinking, um, we've had some requests uh, for you to maybe try changing your mic because I, it's it's been buzzing a bit. Do you have that option or no? No, no. Okay, I'm that's sorry. fine. Thank you for yeah. thank you for that. No, I'm sorry. So um, the answer will be that it will be less. So the um, peak here, if I drew the action potential, it will be um, less, a smaller peak. So if we open the sodium channels and then they inactivate more quickly then they will um, probably, it'll kind of have a plateau here and not much will change with the membrane potential because there really won't be ion channels open until the potassium channels open. And then we would start the repolarization, the going back down towards the equilibrium potential for potassium. Okay, so that's the answer to that question. So um, Alden, or any of the TAs, I can take a few questions about action potentials, graded potentials. We're doing well on time, so. Yeah, if anyone wants to go ahead and raise their hand, I can, I can call on people. I know it's a lot. And they'll be able to watch this again if they want to, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So, Sarah, you can go ahead. Hello. Hi. Um, 
Okay, so I was wondering, like, what causes the sodium voltage channel to get inactivated? Like, is it because of the membrane potential, or does it just inactivate after a certain period of time? Yeah, um, I am not exactly sure. There have been a lot of advances in uh, ion channel structure, and so you know, continually there's being more known about exactly how that's happening because there are definitely charge effects that are changing the um, morphology or the conformation of the protein. For the um, inactivation port, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much is known about that. For the opening and the closing, it's definitely um, the voltage of the membrane because of charged amino acids in the various parts of the channel that causes movement to make those happen. So yeah, that I, if you have access, um, checking the latest on the structures of the ion give you some um, more information about that. It's a really interesting field. Okay, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, but Siujin? Um, hi, sorry. Um, I was wondering if the action potentials occur um, between the myelin sheaths or each. Right, okay. sorry, sorry. So, no, that's perfect. That I think is my next slide. So it's going to happen between the different spaces between the myelin and the nodes of Ron VA. Yeah, not oh. all. Yeah, not all axons are myelinated, though. Oh, but okay. yes, if they are, and I have a figure showing that. But yes, that's a very good point. Um, that that's a very important factor in movement of the action potential down the axon. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? You guys are doing great. This is a really tough topic. I mean, I've had college students who <laughs> are neuroscience majors and you know, it takes them a long time to really get some of these concepts, but I can't encourage you enough to just sit and think about it. This is one of those topics where um, you can kind of hear someone talk about it and you can kind of say, oh yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense, I get it. But then if someone asks you a question about it or maybe an exam question on it, that's when you're like, oh, ooh, maybe I didn't get it. And so the way to really get it and to understand it is, again, is I sit with a piece of paper, write, write, uh, put some little ions on there and have a move and really um, think, sit and think about it. And then you'll get it. And once you get it, you'll be good. Um, Sarah? Oh, sorry. I had another question. So um, I was a little confused about what the threshold is. Is that the membrane potential where all the sodium channels open? Exactly. Yep. So the threshold is the voltage that you're going to need to get a certain percentage of the sodium channels to open, which will then start the um, chain reaction and start the action potential. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think that's all the questions for now. If you okay. kind of that, move forward. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so um, we've talked about this a little bit, but here's another um, image that um, talks about the different parts of the neuron and um, the channels that are present there. And really what you need to know is that in the dendrites and the cell body, the main type of channel that you're going to have are going to be the ligand gated ion channels. So the neurotransmitter gated ion channels. And that's because there'll be synapses with other neurons that are touching the cell body and the dendrites and releasing neurotransmitter and opening or closing ion channels. But then we have the axon that's where we're gonna have the voltage gated channels 
And right here at the beginning of the axon where it's meeting the cell body, you can, that's called the axon initial segment, which is where it's um, basically sensing what's going on in the rest of the cell and deciding whether or not to fire an action potential. Because we said once we start an action potential here, it's going to zip down the axon and go away from the neuron. And so this an axon initial segment is really important and we'll be having action potentials in the axon. But remember, so we said since the cell body and the dendrites are where we have the um, graded potentials, then that means since those are additive and they're in, in, um, in proportion to the stimulus, then all these inputs in the cell body and the dendrite are added up. And if it's enough to get this axon initial segment up to threshold, then there'll be an action potential. So when we think about neurons integrating information or um, responding to different stimuli, graded potentials and if they end up adding to enough to get the axon initial segment to threshold then this neuron will fire so if I could draw this neuron where it had hundreds of other neurons synapsing with it then all those whatever those neurons were signaling to this neuron this neuron would add up all those signals. And then if this little part of the neuron got up to threshold, it would fire an action potential. And we'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. So if we're talking about the neurons adding this information and integrating this information, this is why it's happening. It's happening because the neuron is seeing these graded potentials. And that's what we're showing with this yellow line. So we've talked about how you could have a synapse where the upstream neurons releasing some neurotransmitter. And let's say that neurotransmitter opens up some ligand gated sodium channels. So it fires an action potential, releases neurotransmitter. This membrane then is going to open a some sodium channels. And we said, if we open sodium channels, then the membrane potential is going to depolarize. And so that's what you're seeing right here. We're having a little graded potential here at this number one, where we're having a little bit of positive charge coming in because we've opened some sodium channels. And this is what we call a graded depolarization, just because it's a depolarization and we've let some sodium in. Or we could have let some calcium in, or we could have inhibited some potassium channels. Either way, we've depolarized um, at this little spot. Then we could give a bigger stimulus. That's what's happening in two. You can see it's a bigger depolarization. It's not big enough to get to threshold but maybe um, this upstream neuron is firing twice really quickly, or um, there's several neurons um, here that are releasing that neurotransmitter and opening more sodium channels. So we're getting a bigger depolarization because it's graded, it's in proportion to the stimulus. And so we're closer to threshold with this number two than we were with number one. Number three shows, shows a graded potential, but this is a hyperpolarization. Here, maybe we opened potassium channels, and so with the synapse and with the neurotransmitter. So now we're, the membrane potential is headed towards the equilibrium potential for potassium, and so we've had a hyperpolarization. And so um, now our membrane potential has gone away from threshold. So we've inhibited this 
part of the membrane. We've inhibited this neuron because of the um, hyperpolarization. And then in this example, uh, we could have firing of two neurons nearby at the same time. So they might not be big. So they could be um, not very big, but if they happen at the same time, if neuron one and two fire on the neuron at the same time, that will be additive because these are graded potentials and we'll have a bigger um, depolarization and we'll get closer to threshold. Or we could have one and three happening at the same time and then um, they're really gonna cancel each other out. So it's going to be true that in order to get to threshold, it's going to take multiple stimuli, multiple firings to get an, an axon initial segment to threshold. And so if you have those, let's say synapse one firing, synapse two firing really quickly, then we could get the axon initial segment of that neuron to threshold and then we'll fire an action potential. ...is happening because you're not usually going to have one neuron leading to um, the firing of its downstream neuron. It's usually going to take more than that. But there'll be many, many inputs coming into a single neuron. And so that could be some positive, some negative. And if it's too many negative and not enough positive, there's not going to be firing. If there's enough positive, then there will be firing and we will have an action potential. And so this is where the, act, the neurons are integrating information from many, many sources and deciding whether or not to then fire and send the signal downstream. Okay, and I'm gonna give you some really concrete examples of that, which will hopefully help you understand why this is important for signaling in the nervous system. So it can be based on time. So how frequently is that upstream neuron firing on the downstream one? It could be how many neurons are firing on to that downstream one. And it also has a um, the location of the synapse is also important as well because remember we said that the graded um, potentials they fade and so if you have a, a, a synapse really close to the axon initial segment it could have a bigger impact on threshold um, based on it being so close to the axon initial segment versus farther away. So there's lots of different ways of um, controlling whether or not a downstream neuron responds and fires with action potentials. Okay. So that's kind of how the grade potentials and the axons and the action potentials work together. The graded potentials lead to the action potentials. So we were talking about this a little bit. Another thing to think about with the axon is um, that very often they're myelinated. So I'm assuming in your previous lecture, you learned about Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system and um, oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system, and they myelinate axons. So they wrap the axon in lipid, many, many layers of lipid which insulates it. And so um, that means that then you don't have leakage of ions in that across the membrane the same way you would otherwise. And so there's little um, spaces between the myelination where it isn't happening. Those are called the nodes of Rambier. And so what happens is if we have an action potential at this first node, we're going to have that influx of sodium, and we're going to um, have a depolarization of the membrane here. Instead of it acting just right next door to activate an action potential, because we have this insulation, 
that action potential, the effects of it, and the depolarization from it will be felt all the way over here. And so that way that we will have an action potential here and then one here and then one here instead of having one right next to another. Just a moment. Okay, so when we have myelination, then what that allows us to do is instead having many action potentials like those falling dominoes one after another, we have one here and then an action potential here and one here and one here. And so it speeds up the transmission of the action potential along the axon. So myelination of an axon is going to determine how quickly this um, signal travels as well as the diameter of the axon. So that varies as well. Larger diameter um, axons act very similarly to a wire where if it's a larger diameter, then there's more paths that the um, signal can take, which means there's less resistance and the conductance will be greater. It will be faster. Just something to think about with axons is that we have different types with different neurons that have different speeds depending on the needs of the nervous system for speed. And that will de be determined by whether it's myelinated as well as it's, uh, it's, its diameter. Okay, so we've talked about action potentials. So remember, we're going to first open the sodium channel. So we're gonna have a depolarization heading towards the equilibrium potential for sodium. And then those are gonna inactivate. We're gonna open the potassium channels. And so we're gonna, membrane potential is gonna to head towards the equilibrium potential for potassium. And that those action potentials are going to be all or nothing. Once we get to threshold, they're going to fire and um, then signal very quickly in a very predictable way, and it could be over and over again. Okay, so just to finish up, I am going to um, try to, again, tell you more about why this is important, why we need to have these graded potentials, why we have the action potential signaling along the neurons. And you'll be hearing more about this. And I know your next topic is the synapse, but just to give you a little bit of information about it so you can think about it in terms of the action potential, we're showing here the end of an axon. And so that an action potential will come down the axon and that change in voltage will open voltage-gated cha calcium channels, and that will lead to the release of neurotransmitter, which will then contact and bind to the postsynaptic cell, that downstream cell, which very often these could be ligand-gated ion channels, for instance. And so that will then lead to a graded potential, which if strong enough, will lead to an action potential along the length of that neuron. So you kind of, it's kind of this pattern of you have graded potentials that are coming from synapses or other things, but right now we're talking about synapses. And then if those graded potentials are strong enough, then that will lead to an action potential to travel down that neuron, which, could, which will probably lead to a graded potential in the next neuron. So that's kind of the pattern of signaling between the neurons and then along the length of the neurons. And keep in mind that um, we talked about, I showed this figure before, but this is a little bit of a different way of thinking about it. So we said you could have a depolarization because of um, the release of a neurotransmitter from a synapse or a hyperpolarization. If it's a depolarization that's caused by that synapse, then we would say that that's an excitatory postsynaptic potential. That's just a graded potential that is 
a depolarization. So that would be an excitatory synapse because we're doing what we're seeing in one and two. We're getting going towards threshold. It might not be enough to get to threshold every time, but it's at least getting the cell closer to threshold because we're having a depolarization. That would be an excitatory synapse that releases neurotransmitter and leads to a depolarization. Or we could have inhibitory synapses. Those are going to lead to graded um, hyperpolarizations, and we can call those inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. That's just where when this neuron fires, the synapse fires, we um, hyperpolarize the membrane, and so it's inhibitory because it's making it harder to get to threshold. Now we have a, a larger distance we have to go to get to threshold because now the membrane's more negative than it used to be. So when we talk about inhibitory versus excitatory synapses, that's what we're talking about. Whether we're getting closer to threshold for excitatory synapses or farther away, about synapses soon. Okay, so let's um, answer another question. Would an increase in the number of open potassium channels near the initial segment of the neuron right at the beginning of the axon affect the size of the stimulus required to initiate an action potential? So if we open potassium channels, are we going to um, increase the membrane potential or decrease the membrane potential if we open potassium channels? So think about that. So we'll be decreasing the membrane potential, right? Because we'll be hyperpolarizing the membrane at that point. So if we're hyperpolarizing the membrane because we're opening potassium channels, then what will happen to the stimulus that's going to be needed to get us to threshold for an action potential? Is it going to be smaller or is it going to be, uh, are we going to need a bigger stimulus? Think about that for a minute. So the answer is going to be A. So we're going to need a bigger stimulus. So basically um, this question is, is referring to this case where we're doing a hyperpolarization because we're letting, in, uh, letting potassium out of the cell. And so we're having, we're farther away from threshold. So then if we want to get to threshold, if we've got this synapse firing, it's gonna take a lot more. Um, either rapid secession, rapid fire of some excitatory synapses or more fire, firing of more excitatory synapses, it'll take more to um, activate that axon to have action potentials, okay? Okay, so this is my last um, main slide of new information, and then I have plenty of time to answer questions and we can go back over anything. And this, I'm trying to like, to, to sum this up for you, showing you something a little bit more sophisticated, and that you're gonna be talking about this later, but hopefully this helps you understand exactly how this is happening. And you might wanna, when you see this material again, think about these processes and exactly what's happening at each step in terms of graded potentials versus action potentials, because then you'll understand it much better. So. Here's an example of um, the olfactory um, epithelium. So this would be the epithelium lining the nasal cavity up here. And so this is where you're going to smell. And you have these um, olfactory neurons. That's what's shown in these different colors. And they are sending their axon out to the um, lining of your nasal cavity out to the outside world. And so it's um, a little different here because the axon, the signal from the axon is going to actually go 
towards the cell body, but the axon has um, receptors in them, odorant receptors, olfactory receptors that are in these membranes of the ends of these axons. And when an odorant, a chemical that we can smell, binds its specific receptor, then that is going to activate um, the odorant receptor and lead to a graded potential. So some sort of depolarization, which can then lead to an action potential. So having these graded potentials do the sensing is really helpful because remember we said that they're additive and that they're not all or nothing. And so if we have, you know, a couple of odorant molecules that can bind to a couple of these receptors, we'll have a few graded potentials, but it's not going to be enough to um, start an action potential and we won't ever sense it. We have to have a threshold for sensing. We can't sense every odorant molecule in the environment, it would drive us crazy. So we have um, a certain threshold just because you have to have a number of graded potentials to be able to activate these to have an action potential. And so you'll, when we do sensing of anything, it's going to stimulate a graded potential. And then if that's great enough, to lead to an action potential, then that will get carried to the next layer of neurons that again, will have multiple inputs. And so just one of these cells um, firing an action potential to one of these downstream cells probably isn't gonna really do anything. But if we have enough of that odorant around that is binding multiple receptors on multiple cells and leading to multiple action potentials, then that will lead to firing of, that will lead to um, an action potential traveling down this neuron. Its synapse will um, cause graded potentials in this downstream neuron, and then it will fire action potentials to the next neuron and eventually get to our consciousness of smelling something. So when we're sensing things, we're often using graded potentials, which is great because they're responding in proportion to what they're sensing. But in general, when an act, a neuron is signaling, it's signaling via action potentials. And that's difficult because remember, we said action potentials are all or none. So if this neuron is firing, how does it let that downstream neuron know, hey, there's a really big signal coming or eh, it's not so strong. That will be via the action potential frequency. So if these guys are really being activated a lot and having lots of great potentials that are taking it to threshold many times, then these will be firing very frequent action potentials which will lead to a lot of great potentials, which will make these more likely to fire action potentials and fire them more frequently and on and on and on. So the language of the nervous system in communicating is through graded potentials and whether they're strong enough to initiate an action potential and then via action potentials in terms of their frequency. So that if the stimulus is really strong, then they'll be firing action potentials really frequently, which will then activate or inhibit, depending on the neuron and the network that they're in, the next downstream neuron. So hopefully that helps you get a picture of um, how these types of signaling are going to function in the nervous system. And it's really the basis of all the signaling because once you understand the signaling, and understand the different types of networks and ways that neurons can get come together, then it um, hopefully will make more sense to you how all this is getting accomplished. So just to last summary slide, we've got these neurons. They've got tons of information coming to their dendrites, their cell bodies, and that is going to be summated. And if enough, 
that will then um, lead to an action potential. And um, you'll hear more about neurotransmitters and how that's a very rapid way of signaling between two cells and then with the action potential being a very fast way of signaling along the length of a neuron. Okay, so the last question. So if we had a postsynaptic neuron, so this neuron that's um, on the receiving side of the synapse, what changes would increase the likelihood of this uh, neuron to fire? So if I increase the number of excitatory synapses onto this neuron, would that increase its firing, its chances of firing an action potential? Yeah, it would, right? So that means if we have a lot of excitatory synapses, that means that if they fire, they're leading to a depolarization of this membrane, which means it's getting closer to threshold, which means it's more likely to fire because if it's sitting up here at a higher membrane potential, then it's gonna take less to get it up to threshold. Okay, what if we have a synapse this uh, neuron is really firing very frequently. Would that make this more likely to fire? So yeah, it would as well, just because remember we said that these can be additive. If this keeps firing over and over again quickly enough, then we're having many graded potentials in a short period of time and those can add up and get this membrane up to threshold. But if we moved an inhibitory synapse closer to the initial segment, then that would not increase our potential of action potential, uh, likelihood of action potential firing. So the answer is D, because if we move an inhibitory synapse closer, remember we said the proximity to the initial segment matters because the effect of the synapse goes down the farther way you get because of the diffusion of ions. So if we move an inhibitory synapse, meaning it's um, causing a hyperpolarization of the membrane closer to the initial segment, then you, you can still get firing of this neuron. It's just gonna take more of a stimulus, okay? So I think that's it. I am happy to take as many questions as we have about any of this. Okay, I can call on people. So okay. Dana, um, you have your hand up. Um, hi, Professor, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, you explained this incredibly well. It makes a great deal of sense. So thank awesome. you. Awesome, good. Um, I wanted to know, if there are generally more uh, ligand-gated channels than voltage-gated, does it vary between the PNS and CNS or between different parts of the brain? Not that I, not that I know of. It's going to be very specific to just the certain cell, um, the very specific cell. Um, okay. But it will be the most predictable is just that the dendrite and the cell body will be where you have the ligand gated, gated and the axon will be where you have the voltage gated. But makes sense. You know, there's so much diversity among ac uh, neurons. Some neurons have tons of dendrites and very uh, pretty pitiful axons. So it'll depend on um, a lot on the morphology of the neuron. But, and there always will be exceptions as well. So, you know. That's what makes it so fun. Yes. <laughs> Liliana, you can go ahead. Hey, thank you. Um, so I, um, I didn't understand um, the second to last question, because um, I remember you were talking about how increasing the stimulus didn't necessarily increase the um, AP. Can you can you talk more about that? Okay, uh, increasing the stimulus doesn't necessarily. So 
There's a couple things. Um, if you're talking about a neuron firing onto another neuron, then you want to know, is that an excitatory synapse or an inhibitory synapse? And so if it's excitatory, then that means it's getting it closer to threshold. And if it's inhibitory, then that means it's going away from threshold. But just because you have an inhibitory synapse that's firing, that doesn't mean it can't be overcome. Okay, so this question, question four, Let's say um, we had two of these inhibitory synapses and then we increase it to 10. Then that will make it more difficult to have an action potential in this downstream cell because we have more inhibitory synapses. That doesn't mean though, if we fired the 200 excitatory synapses that are nearby, that we couldn't still have an action potential. It just makes it less likely because we're starting Hopefully that answers the question. Um, it does, and if I can ask one more question. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It would be, um, so what happens when, um, people are desensitized to sensory information on the neural level. Um, yeah, that's a great, there's um, going to be several different levels of that, but, and I don't know if you guys are gonna hear about that, but that's really wonderful, um, important that we can get used to and desensitized. So some of that can be at the um, level of the receptor where it's not as prevalent. Um, and so it becomes less sensitive, um, but then there can also be higher level um, processes as well. So um, one example is with vision, for instance. So we have um, the little molecule that uh, senses light, it has to be, it gets changed when the photon hits it. And so then it has to be converted back to its active form. And so processes like that can also be affected um, as well in terms of having to be turned over to be able to respond again. So yeah, there's lots of different ways and it's really important so that we can focus on what we want to focus on. So there's all the level of how much you're sensing it but then there's also, we have a great ability to just weed out things that we don't want to pay attention to, and that's gonna be at a higher level. So to listen to me talk, you're hopefully focusing on me. You're not paying attention to the fact that your clothes are touching your skin or that you know, you're feeling your chair on your body. You're able to weed that out. So it's, there's many levels of that. Thank you. Uh -huh. Aria, you can go ahead. Thank you. Hello, Professor. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you, like the person before me actually asked, um, could you like expand your mention of the threshold if olfactory perception and smell detection and everything, like how that works? How the body decides what to sense and what not to sense? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I That is not my area of expertise. I'm also not certain how much is really well understood about that. But yes, we can, um, some of it is what we choose to do and we've learned to do, but then there are also neuronal circuits that um, help that to happen. So for instance, um, there's crosstalk between um, like our itch receptors and our pain receptors. So that um, if our itch receptors are kind of acting, that pathway is active, then we can kind of inhibit that pathway by inducing pain. So you, you scratch at something that itches so that you can um, reduce one sensation for another. So there's um, 
lots of built in circuits that allow us to do that as well. Or another example is um, if we're sensing, wanting to sense a point, we uh, highlight the part of our skin where the point's actually touching, but we inhibit the touch sensors right around it, which makes it more noticeable that it's a point instead of just a blunt object. And there's very specific um, networks of neurons that allow that to happen. It's pretty interesting actually, so that I can feel a difference between a point of my pen versus the other more blunt side, even though I'm really kind of depressing a similar amount of skin based on having a mixture of um, excitatory and inhibitory neurons that let me do that. So yeah, it's super complicated and at many different levels. And I'm also not an expert in it, but it's really interesting. That's so fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys will be hearing a little bit bit, um, more about that in the vision and sensory systems lecture later in the course. Um, But for the next question, Ibrahim, you can go ahead and unmute. Hello? Uh Hi, I just had a general question regarding the application of physics within uh, neuroscience. Um, So within, say, action potentials and neural circuitry, how would you see that kind of having an effect? Thank you. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, so I didn't show... Um, equations, but, you know, the the resistance and the current, those are the same equations. Um, Another thing I didn't talk about is the capacitance of the membrane, which is really important in how many charges have to move to, to change the membrane potential a certain amount. So that's all the same equations. So yes, um, this is a good place where you have a lot of intersection between physics and biology is in neuroscience. So yes, anything you think should apply in terms of physics probably does in the same way that it would. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Vineeth, you can go ahead. Hi, Professor. Um, I just wanted to touch upon like the initial segment and like if you could just like briefly review that because I was like kind of confused and like why that's important. Yeah, so it's really somewhat just the geometry is the way you could think about it is that um, you're getting all of these signals from synapses in the dendrites and the cell and the cell body. And that's just in the form of ions, often positive ions coming in. And then they're going to diffuse out. And so it's just since this is the first part of the axon and there's tons of voltage gated channels this is going to be where it's sensed. This is where threshold manifests itself. If because of the geometry, if this part gets the threshold, then you're gonna fire an action potential down here. This part of the axon isn't involved in signaling just because in, in terms of the same way the axon initial segment, just because it's right here. And if you sense it here, If you get to threshold here, you're going to fire an action potential. If you had a big enough stimulus to to sense it here and get above threshold, it doesn't matter because you're going to have an action potential here first, and then it's going to travel down. Does that make sense? Okay. So like if you're doing, you know, an experiment, technically you could activate the signal bar. Yes. Yeah. So if you caused, um, if you had an electrode and you caused a, um, this part of the axon to ha- come to threshold, you would have an action potential go down the axon, but it would also come back up. Because, uh, like a wave. 
or like a way because these, since you didn't have an action potential here, these sodium channels aren't inactivated. Okay. So, so the only, when you have, sorry, you can continue. Yeah, no, no. So that's why uh, the geometry matters is okay. you, you start having an action potential here. And so it's going to continue down because you started at the end. If you mm -hmm. started in the middle, it would go in both directions. Okay. So but, if I had, so, usually like the, usually the ligand um, attaches like near the dendrites, right? So like, is there, how does that information get relayed to the axon? Yeah. So the um, synapses could be anywhere. So oh, okay. it doesn't just have to be on the dendrite. It's, it could be almost anywhere and there's exceptions. So it could really be anywhere. But um, that is why it's going to be rare that one little synapse firing is going to lead to an action potential. Okay. It's really going to have to be many, many firing in a similar time as yes, this is a big cell and these grade potentials don't travel that far. And many, you know, we're talking about lots and lots, hundreds of synapses. And so um, if this, if a synapse fires right here, it's not going to lead to an action potential here, but it can contribute, it can help. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You then, know, it's, in biology, uh, like in high school, we were like taught that, oh, dendrites are the places where, you know, it like it first starts. But I didn't know that it could start like almost anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just the sim and it's a simplification. And yeah. we were talking about dendrites are taking the information in towards the cell mm -hmm. body, which they do. But it's just more complicated than that. And okay, there's a lot so more much. going on. Yeah, no problem. Nessia, you can go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering, like, the threshold, are, is the threshold of every neuron the same, or does it differ depending on what the neuron does, where it is? Yeah, it'll differ just depending on the specific channel. So when we're talking about the voltage-gated or the potassium-gated uh, channels, there's many different types. There's plenty of different voltage gated types and their thresholds will differ slightly. So yeah, it's, it's going to definitely be still um, negative as far as I know. Um, but yeah, it's, it will vary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Magna, you can go ahead. Okay. Hi. I'm not sure if my question is going to make sense, but like, for instance, if during an action potential, like, are there any, like, possible, was there, like, a chance that something, like, something went wrong during an action potential, like, all the, like, the um, sodium channel closed early, and then, and if so, what problems did it cause? Yeah, it's, um, I guess the way I would think about it is that when we're talking about this, we're talking about many, many, many channels. And um, when, if you're really sophisticated when you're talking about action um, ion channels, you're talking about things like open probability. So it's. So it's like um, million? Well, it's not that few, but it's. Um, there's probably, there's not many times when all the channels are doing, every single copy of channel is doing the same thing. Okay. Because one guy will open, a, one channel open a little bit earlier, one might inactivate a little earlier. It's just the average of what's going on that we're talking about. Okay. And the other thing is just that um, there's lots of copies of these and once you get one activated then that channel is letting in sodium which is then activating the others and so 
it's pretty easy to get them all, most of them, the vast majority of them open and uh, moving. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Ralph, you can go ahead. Thank you. Hi. Um, I liked today's lecture. It was really um, like entertaining. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question back to the beginning when we were talking about potassium and um, sodium levels. So at first, like the positive negative charges in the cell are um, equal. And then the potassium like goes down the concentration gradient and it gets out of the cell, which makes it really negative. And then, so because it's so negative, some potassium is like pulled back in. Mm. But like what happens after that? I really was confused after that. For the action potential? Yeah. So, oh, okay. Or are you talking about reaching equilibrium potential? Oh, I think it's reaching equilibrium potential. Yeah, okay. So um, you, you're right. So the potassium is going to leave and then they're going to start coming in. And then just the equilibrium potential means you've got an equal number leaving as you have coming in. And so that means it's happy now. Does that make sense? Because now um, the chemical gradient is equaling the equal um, the electrical gradient and it's just going to stay there because they're just circling around five are leaving and five are coming back in. So the membrane potential is just gonna stay there as long as the potassium channels are staying open and they're the only ones open. Mm, okay. Thank okay. You. Yeah, hopefully that helps. Thank you. Okay, and it doesn't look like there's any more questions, but I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering what advice you have for young aspiring neuroscientists. Oh, yeah. I, honestly, it's just sitting and thinking about things after you hear a lecture, because these are tough concepts. But if you get a picture of in your mind of these concepts and what's happening, then if someone says, oh, well, what would happen if you did this? you can figure that out for yourself. So that's what I would, that's my biggest advice. And you all are so lucky to have as many resources as you have. I'm, I teach a, a Coursera course. It's a MOOC. It's uh, introductory to human physiology. That's basically where this lecture came from. It's free to anyone. And, you know, there's so much out there that, um, it, it's probably overwhelming, but you definitely don't have the problem of not having um, access to great learning material. So you can just take advantage of it. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Carberry. That was a fantastic lecture. And thank, thank you, you so much for volunteering your time and, and your energy to give it. It was so much fun. So thank you guys very, very much for listening to me ramble on. <laughs> so we'll conclude the lecture now. If anyone has more questions, um, keep, just keep those in mind for a section. Uh, but thank you everyone for attending.